So let's combine and by combining it, kind of review the stuff we have done this week. Let's say f of x equals x cubed minus 5x squared plus x plus 1. Uh, just coming up with something at random. And let's, let's just investigate this. Let's find and classify local exodrema. And let's find and classify inflection points. In reference to this word classify, um, Local extrema can be local maxima or local minima. Um, inflection points don't have sort of titles like that, but it still makes sense if you have an inflection point to ask what's going on. Is it going from concave up to concave down or vice versa? So, it makes the most sense to do this problem first, because local extrema require the first derivative, infection points require the second derivative. So, I mean, in one sense, it doesn't matter which of these we do first, but it probably makes the most sense to take the derivative, use it, then take the second derivative, use it. I mean, at least that's how I see things. Let me say the one, the one thing I miss from physical white boards is just copying stuff into a corner and then having it for the rest of the class. Here is our function, this cubic polynomial. And for the first part of this <coughs> problem, for the local extrema, we are going to need the first derivative. And hopefully this is a routine derivative at this point. We're using the power rule, the sum rule, the constant multiple rule. So in one sense, we're using a lot of rules, but also, we've been taking derivatives like this for over a month now. Every time I say something like that, I have sort of freeze up and double check to make sure I haven't made any mistakes, but this is good. So, for critical value candidate, we won't know immediately whether these are critical values or not, but the candidates to be critical values are the values where the derivative 
equals zero. And you can tell this really was just a randomly selected problem because this doesn't factor or do anything nice. We can hit it with the quadratic formula, though, which, I mean, one of those things I've memorized because I teach college algebra literally every semester. I don't know if most people in this room of math majors would have committed it to memory, but the quadratic formula, this room of non-math majors, the <coughs> quadratic formula is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. And now it's just plugging and playing, but it requires a certain amount of care. For example, this b includes the negative sign. I mean, this b is negative 10. So negative, negative b is positive 10. Similarly, if you go into your calculator and type negative 10 squared minus 4 times 3 times 10, unless you're very careful, you're probably going to end up with a error. Because if you tell your calculator negative 10 squared, your calculator is going to say, okay, order of operations, first we square it, then we multiply by negative 1. And that will give the calculator negative 100. That's not what's going on here. Any number squared is positive. Negative 10 squared is positive 100. Minus 4 times 3 times 1, which is negative 12. So, so far the assessments I've given have all been either uh, online or take home. Um, you don't have necess I don't, you don't have to memorize the quadratic formula. If I did give in-class assessment and you needed it, I just remind you of what it is, but you do need to be able to use it if it shows up in a problem like it is here. 10 plus or minus the square root of 88 over 6. And my inclination is always just to get a decimal approximation, especially in a classroom that, as I say, is a lot of pharmacy people, a lot of non-math majors. Because, I mean, if you're in pharmacy, what are you going to do with a number like that? Are you going to give a patient 10 plus the square root of 88 over 6 milligrams of something? It's just not very helpful for most real world purposes. So, Ten plus the square root of eighty-eight 
divided by 6 is 3.23. And if we turn that addition into subtraction, zero point one zero. Since we don't have any real world problem with significant digits, I'm keeping two decimal places more or less arbitrarily. So these are maybe our critical values. At this point, all we know is that the derivative is zero there. That doesn't mean these are local extrema. It just means there are candidates to be local extrema. So we need to follow this up with some kind of further investigation. And at the moment, the technique we have available to us for that is the first derivative test. So I'm going to try to, as efficiently as I can, I'm going to try to copy some stuff to the next frame. We need, we need the first derivative for the first derivative test. Let's make sure, yep, that's correct. And we need on a number line to mark off our critical values. Zero point ten, three point two three. At this point in time, it's occurring to me I've kind of been talking without respite. Does anybody have any questions about? these first two frames, how we started here and ended up there. Um, if not, then the first derivative test says, okay, pick a value in this interval in this interval and in this interval and then determine whether the function at that value is positive or negative and the value you select does not matter i mean We've rounded to two decimal places, so probably 3.231 or something would not be a good idea. But other than that, you know, for this last piece, 5 or 10 or 100, it doesn't really matter. Um, I guess if you pick a nice value, you can do this in your head and not have to go to your calculator. And that's pretty much the only difference the specific value makes. So 26. Um, I mean, the actual detail of the derivative is not important. What is significant is that it's a positive number.
anything between 0.10 and 3.23. Again, I mean, don't be, don't do something ridiculous. We're rounding to three to two decimal places, something like 3.229 or something would be a bad choice, but I mean, the obvious choices are one, two, and three, nice integers. If we let x be one, then this is negative. Three minus 10 plus one is negative six. And I always, just because it's usually so easy to work with, if I have the option of selecting zero for one of my pieces, I usually do. And again, the actual value doesn't matter. What matters is that it's positive. So these critical values, these local extrema candidates, really are local extrema. Remember that we have a local extrema anytime the first derivative changes sign. So from positive to negative is a local extremum here then from negative to positive is a local extremum there. And, and now it's a matter of remembering the first derivative test, um, which I mean, it, it can be memorizing anything can be kind of annoying, I know. I, I don't miss that aspect of being a student, but um, going from positive to negative is a max. Going from negative to positive is a min. And if you, I mean, if you wrote that on a test, I would find it maybe a little bewildering. So let's try to write our answer in a nicer way. There's a local maximum at, well, x is 0 0.10. If we're interested in maxima and minima, we probably want to know why, right? I mean, if I tell you a function takes on its a maximum value at 0 0.10, I think the most natural question to ask next is, well, what is the maximum then? And this is something that we don't have written on the whiteboard yet, but we can figure it out. And again, a lot of the trouble, a lot of the mistakes I'm used to seeing on this material is just using the wrong function for the wrong thing. We want to know what f of x has as a maximum value. So that 0 0.10 is going into f of x. Now just, okay, let's, Point ten. Let's see if this will give us an error message. Oh, 
Okay, so x is point 0.10. x cubed minus 5x squared plus x plus 1. Come on, cooperate with me. x cubed minus 5x squared plus x plus 1, 1.051. That's uh, and a local min at three point two three. And again, I think if I say, okay, there's a minimum value somewhere, the question you almost certainly should be asking is, okay, what is the minimum? It occurs at 3.23. So let's take 3.23, put it in for x. Then x cubed minus 5x squared plus x plus 1. And, I mean, I'm not sure if how, much, how familiar most people really are with these calculators. I mean, if you buy them for one course in high school and never use them again. This is saving us a few keystrokes, but you could certainly just type 3.23 cubed minus 5 times 3.23 squared plus 3.23 plus one, a few more keystrokes, but you don't have to understand your calculator's store feature. Negative 14.24. And this I mean, we could go to Desmos and verify it if we wanted to, but this looks right to me. When I see a cubic, I think that the cubic is going to look something like that. And first, it's going to have a local max, and then it's going to have a local min. And that's just what we saw in this problem. So, the problem is either done or half done, depending on how you want to count things. If this was a test, I could make this problem 1a and problem 1b, or I could make it problem 1 and 2. In any event, we are was not trying to erase there. We have successfully found and classified some local extrema. Does anybody have, at this point, any questions about how we started here? And wound up there.
If not, let's find some inflection points. And I showed a little restraint with this problem. Um, polynomials are almost unique in the sense that they become nicer when you take their derivative. Polynomials and logarithms are really the only functions that do that. So, the second derivative, which we need for the critical, um, sorry, for the inflection points, is actually going to be easier to work with than the first derivative, which we used here. Let me... Let me call this part two. And the advantage of doing stuff in this order, that is, first the critical values, then the inflection points, is that to find the inflection points, you need the second derivative. And to find the second derivative, you need the first derivative. So it makes the most, this is kind of the natural order to go in, because by the time you need the second derivative, you'll already have the first one. 3x squared minus 10x plus 1. For the critical values, it's, sorry, I keep uh, misspeaking there. For the infection points, we find them just like we did critical values and local extrema, except that it's the second derivative we're working with. So, 6x minus 10. In theory, you can have an infection point where the second derivative equals zero or the second derivative doesn't exist. In practice, 99 times out of 100, the second derivative exists everywhere. And that's true here. Um, and again, I tend to kind of skate over this, but why would the second derivative not exist? Well, if there's any division, then dividing by zero would give you an error. So if there's any division, there might be values where the second derivative doesn't exist. If there's a square root and you end up with the square root of a negative number, that would be a value where the second derivative doesn't exist. If there's a logarithm, you wind up with the logarithm of a non-positive number. But there's none of that here. This is just a linear expression. It exists everywhere. We will set this thing equal to zero. So where let's separate off that function notation. We just have six x minus ten equal to zero. So, some really pre-algebra, but don't 
don't be totally careless. You've seen me stand here and do some pretty silly things over the semester. It's easy to make little mistakes. We add 10 to both sides, then we divide both sides by 6. And I'm not a fanatic for simplification, but 10 sixths is 5 thirds. So there is maybe part of the inflection point. I say part because point is right there in the name. 5 thirds is not a point. But just like we didn't know immediately that those were local extrema, we had to verify it with the first derivative test. We don't know immediately that 5 thirds is an infection point. We have to verify it with, well, there's no way to end that sentence because this test doesn't have a nice name like the first derivative test, but we're going to create a sign chart just like we do with the first derivative test, and we're going to mark our candidate just like we do with the first derivative test. And the only difference is that we are now using, rather than the first derivative, the second derivative. So 5 thirds, what's a number greater than 5 thirds? Um, 10. Again, selecting completely at random. It doesn't matter what number you select. It just needs to be in this region, in the greater than 5 thirds region. And 60 minus 10 is 50. The details don't matter, but 50 is a positive number. That's what matters. Over here, zero is less than five thirds. Negative ten is negative. So we do have an infection point. The second derivative is changing sign meaning that the concavity is changing. And let's remind ourselves, because we only introduced concavity yesterday, it's changing from concave down to concave up. We haven't, I sort of touched on this earlier, an infection point is a point. Five-thirds is not a point. And also, and again, if you just gave me that on a test without anything else, it might be a little bewildering. So let's write down our answer clearly. There is an inflection point going from concave down to concave up. Five thirds, comma. Well, once again, back 
to the beginning. Uh, X is five thirds. We want, we're interested in the original function. We're going to plug that five thirds into F of X. Again, you can you can save yourself some keystrokes, but that's basically five thirds cubed minus five times five thirds squared plus five thirds plus one. What sort of fret? is this. Um, again, you can always yell at me if I'm doing stuff on the calculator and you have no idea what. Um, five thirds is a fraction. My point should either be all fractions or all decimals. So my options are change five thirds to a decimal or change this to a fraction. And I suspect this is a pretty nasty looking fraction, but I can go to math. You see, convert to fraction. Yeah, let's, uh, let's turn five thirds into a decimal. Again, this is something that's kind of hard to work with in any real world setting, I think. So five thirds, that's one and two thirds. So we've been keeping two decimal places. One and two thirds should be 1.6 repeating. Let's see. And our decimal, well, I can just read it off negative 6.59. Okay. And that's either problem done or the second problem done, depending on whether you want to count what we've done today as one or two problems. But we found and classified the critical values. We found and classified the infection points. What we should do we have a little time remaining. Calculus this is, is a tool in applied mathematics. You use calculus to solve real world problems. And I don't think calculus textbooks always do a very great job of grounding the material in the real world. I think you can, um, can read a calculus textbook and, um, learn all about infection points and still have very little idea what they are from a real world point of view. And where infection points tend to show up in the real world is as points of diminishing returns. So let's say that you are running a business 
and you are spending money on advertising. And spending money on advertising is hopefully generating revenue. People are seeing your ads, and therefore they're buying your product. And you look at a graph and maybe you see something like this. Let me let me just sort of can't erase it without erasing the entire thing. But maybe you see something like that. Um, so if you're spending a very small amount on advertising, that's basically the same as not advertising at all. I mean, I have a friend, a local business owner, who talks to me about how, yeah, I used to advertise a little on this local radio show, and it didn't do anything, so I had to stop. So small amounts of advertisement are accomplishing very little. Then there's this kind of sweet spot where the money you're spending on advertising is clearly causing a substantial increase in revenue. But it's also possible to be so saturated, to advertise so much, that additional advertising doesn't do much of anything anymore. Like, from a consumer point of view, if you're watching a football game and you see 10 McDonald's ads versus seeing 11 McDonald's ads. At that point, it's probably not making much of a difference, that extra advertisement. And that's reflected here, where the graph is flattening off. Mathematically, we have a horizontal asymptote, and this graph is always increasing. The more you spend on advertising, the more you see in revenue. In practice, though, this can eventually reach the point where you know you're spending an additional thousand dollars in advertising to create an additional five dollars in revenue. It can get to the point where it's not profitable. And there is a point in here called the point of diminishing returns, where the Revenue you are generating from advertisement starts to slow down. And you need to start seriously considering how much additional advertisement you want to do. And that point of diminishing returns is right there. And it is precisely the inflection point of this graph, where the curve goes from being concave up to concave down. 
And you see curves that look basically like this a lot. They even have their own name. They're called logistic curves. Like, maybe an example that would be closer to home for most of you. You see these same curves when you look at time spent studying versus, let's say, you're in a language course, vocabulary, words, memorized. You see the exact same kind of graph. Just studying for five minutes, not super useful, in spite of all of those language programs that swear you can become fluent in only ten minutes a day by downloading their app. At some point, you study too much, you sort of burn out. At this point, you're no longer being productive. But there's a sweet spot in the middle where additional studying is producing a lot of additional learning. So the graph is basically the same. There's still this point of diminishing returns. It's still the inflection point of the graph. So this is, I would say, the major application of the second derivative and this um, finding inflection points. It gives you points of diminishing returns. And that is it for the lesson. It is not quite it for the section. I'll um, but we've covered the most important material. I'll take a look at the quiz, and I'll edit it if need be, so that you can start it and complete it by the posted due date. If there's anything there that we haven't covered, I'll tear it out.